This is the Southland, USA. A land of cherished memories in song and legend of early Americana. A region of historic romance. And today, in the stream of 20th century progress, still a land of gracious living. This is the territory of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. Pioneer, builder, public servant in the industrial and agricultural heart of the central Southland. This is the story of a railroad which has been built under the impulse of private enterprise into an ultra-modern, progressive transportation system whose constant purpose is to promote the welfare and development of the South and the nation. Today, as always, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, known throughout the South as the Old Reliable, is inseparably linked with the territory it serves. For passenger travel, a great fleet of ultra-modern trains, the well-known blue and gold dieselized streamliners, in luxurious high-speed service north and south, east and west, headed by the Hummingbird, a blue ribbon train that covers the 927 miles between Cincinnati and New Orleans on a 20-hour schedule. Another L and N Blue Ribbon passenger train, the Crescent, in service between New York and New Orleans via Atlanta, Georgia, and Montgomery, Alabama. Other L and N trains in round-the-clock service between the Southland and all points east, north, and west. The Georgian, the Pan American, the South Wind, the Gulf Wind, the Flamingo, the Dixieland. Travel via any of these trains and you enjoy the best there is in modern rail transportation. Air conditioning in every car. Easy riding in daylight deluxe coach travel. Luxurious overnight sleeper service. The comforts of fine club and tavern lounge cars. And as for diner service, well, try the seafood platter, fresh from Gulf waters. The country ham breakfast, hickory smoked, prepared in Kentucky, especially for the railroad, to mention but a couple of the tasty treats which are served to you on the L&N. But there are many other pleasures besides gastronomical ones offered to travelers throughout the Southland. This is Cumberland Falls, one of the myriad tourist attractions of this great region. Here, the visitor lingers for a moment to absorb the flavor of this land. Now we have a glimpse of the famous Mammoth Caves of Kentucky, visited every year by thousands of people from all over the world. Then to the city of Louisville, industrial center, home of the L and N, and of one of the greatest events in the world of sports, the Kentucky Derby. This is Stephen Foster country. And here, near Bardstown, Kentucky, is my old Kentucky home. A few miles farther south, and we are in Abe Lincoln country. This is the Lincoln Memorial, Hodgenville, Kentucky. And this is the memorial near Hopkinsville, Kentucky, to Jefferson Davis, who was president of the Confederacy. Across the state line into Tennessee. For those with a sense of American history before Lincoln's time, the Hermitage near Nashville home of General Andrew Jackson, hero of the War of 1812 and seventh president of the United States. Policies of the Confederacy were formed in this Capitol building at Montgomery, Alabama. Still farther south, near Mobile, the world-renowned Bellingrath Gardens attract visitors from all parts of the country. Fun for vacationists in the Southland mile on mile along the Mississippi Gulf Coast beach line, the American Riviera. It doesn't matter what the calendar says, 
because along this Gulf coastline, there is no such thing as season, for the season is all year round. The warm sun is practically a permanent resident. But we must be on the move to the southern terminus of the L and N Railroad, to the city of romance, New Orleans. In its exotic French Quarter, the old world meets the new in architecture, food, and manner of living. And then the world-famous Mardi Gras, climax of the city's high spirits and colorful gaiety, turning the town into a festive carnival land in the spring of the year. But the Southland is more than a picturesque place to visit, more than a mecca for those in search of holiday recreation. The other side of the picture is the business of everyday living and working. This is rich agricultural country. From the top of Kentucky, through Tennessee, and into the deep south of Baldwin County, Alabama, southern agriculture is modern agriculture. Mechanization is the order of the day, with tractors, combines, corn pickers, potato diggers, and other mechanical equipment a familiar sight. In the old days, King Cotton ruled the agricultural roost throughout the area. Today, cotton is still a very important crop, but only one of many. Today, diversified crops form a production pattern of major importance to the economy of the region. From potatoes, peanuts, soybeans, grain and corn, to fruits, vegetables, tobacco, poultry, cattle and dairy products. This is a partial roll call of products and produce shipped to consumer markets from southern farms via L and N fast freight service. Another aspect of life and work in the Central South, in the bluegrass region of Kentucky, home of the finest horse flesh in America. From these stock farms come an endless parade of champions. Man o' war. Citation, Whirl Away, 20 Grand, and others too numerous to mention. Champions, all of them, raised in this region and transported to race tracks from one end of the country to the other. And horses for riding pleasure. The American Saddlebred, the Tennessee Walking Horse, and other horses for bridle path and mountain road born and bred on these bluegrass farms in the tradition of the Old South. This is the New South, and a key factor in the freight traffic of the l and Railroad is the business of mining and shipping coal, basic element in the development of worldwide industry, source of heat for comfort, of energy for the creation of power and mass production, and of innumerable chemical byproducts. Coal by the million tons taken out of the earth in Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and Virginia. Hundreds of mines that make this region among the greatest coal sources in the world. No railroad in America has a closer association with the coal industry than the l &M. It serves the rich coal fields in eastern Kentucky, east Tennessee, southwest Virginia, western Kentucky, and Alabama. These fields are nationally recognized as vast reservoirs of highest quality domestic, industrial, byproduct, and gas coals. Many millions of dollars have been expended by the LNN for construction of numerous extensions to serve additional coal areas, for improvements to existing lines and coal fields, and for enlargement and modernization of terminal and classification yards. More millions spent in the purchase of thousands of new coal cars to facilitate movement from mines to markets throughout the nation. Through the years, thousands of cars loaded every day and sent on their way to classification yards for weighing and billing 
and to be made up into trains for routing to market destinations online or on connecting lines throughout the United States and Canada. Only a few miles out of Birmingham is one of the largest iron ore deposits in the world, with major deposits of coal and limestone nearby. Nowhere else in the world are coal, limestone, and iron ore found together in such abundant deposits. Based on this generous bounty, great industry and a great city have been built, given impetus by branch and mainline transportation supplied by the L and N Railroad. From an obscure village in 1871 to a thriving industrial metropolis of more than 350,000 today. A city of steel mills, blast furnaces, manufacturing plants creating a vast variety of products. That is the story of Birmingham. The L and N is proud of its role in that story, playing an important part in its development and continuing growth. Almost half of the nation's commercial forest area is in the south. Today, a major industry has been developed based on this important natural resource. From these great forests come the materials for an infinite variety of products, from toothpicks to telephone poles, from housing materials and furniture to paper and other wood pulp products. For many years, the L and N has had a deep and active interest in greater forest conservation for the South, with a group of company employees assigned to carry out the L and N's own good forest program. These forestry experts have combined work for company-owned forests with that of timber benefits for the entire region served by the company. Coal, coke, iron ore, oil, agriculture, and forest products. These have always been the predominant items on the L&N freight manifest sheets. But today, a new element of major importance appears, a dominant factor in freight traffic and an index to the changing economy of the South, namely, manufactured commodities. The last 10 years have seen an almost phenomenal growth of industrial activity throughout the L and N served South, expansion of existing industries, and an ever increasing influx of industry from other sections of the country, in aluminum, iron and steel, in paper mills, in rubber, chemicals, and a wide variety of other finished and semi-finished products. During the past 10 years, over 1,500 new industries have located in cities and towns served by the L&N Railroad, thus greatly expanding the diversification of production and the flow of manufactured goods in the southern states. What factors have proven so attractive to induce industries to settle in the South? First, its people, the South's greatest resource. The accelerated migration of industry southward during the past 10 years has been largely due to the ample supply of intelligent, willing, and capable native-born workers available. Southern labor has proven its ability, trainability, and productiveness. Second, immeasurable wealth of natural resources, coal, iron ore, phosphate rock, and other minerals, natural gas, oil, and forests, all close at hand. Nature has been especially kind to the South with respect to water, which is virtually the lifeblood of numerous industries. Adequate rainfall, many rivers, lakes, and underground streams give the South an abundance of water resources. Ample electric power is vital to industrial growth. Both private and publicly owned companies have engaged in very extensive expansion programs during recent years to provide adequate power for the expanding South. The steam generating plants of these companies consume great quantities of coal. The South is also blessed with a mild climate, which makes it possible for many industries to 
to largely or completely dispense with buildings required for plant operations in other sections of the country. Good plant sites are readily available all along the l &N Railroad. The l &N Industrial Development Department, with the aid of other departments, is continuously developing such areas and bringing them to the attention of industries seeking new locations. Important in the southbound track of industries has been the regional promotion by the l &N Industrial Development Department, which continues an aggressive campaign designed to attract new industries to the l &N served south. Last, but by no means least important, convenient, low-cost rail transportation. Nearly 5,000 miles of L&N trackage. A great network of rails that penetrates every sector of the Central South, with convenient connections to all points east, west, and north. To keep pace with, and a step or two ahead of the steady growth in the territory it serves, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad has expanded its services, adding to its plant its repair shops, its rolling equipment, its trackage. For a modern progressive railroad is never finished. It must build and refurbish with the people, the cities, the industries along its lines. To maintain its function as private builder and public servant, the l &N has always maintained a continuous program of rebuilding and expansion. In the nine years following World War II, the company spent more than $275 million for improvement. For new equipment in the form of freight and passenger cars, locomotives, automatic safety devices, new yards, and the most modern machinery for maintenance, repair, and operation throughout the system. A program of investment spending that translates into fast, safe, and dependable service expedited by stepped-up efficiency in yard, road, and terminal handling. A notable example of expedited service is the use of CTC, or Centralized Traffic Control, an automatic safety and signal device to speed up traffic on single-track sections. The CTC board, with a complete diagram of the section it controls, with all sidings, switches, and signals all under electronic control of the dispatcher. No written orders to engineers, no stopping to throw switches, no delays, very little time lost waiting on sidings, allowing high speed, safe, through traffic in both directions. Use of radio communication, another new development in railroad operations, resulting in increased efficiency and greater safety for passenger and shipper alike, not only in yard operations, but also in transit. The new l &N cars we see here represent a recent company investment made to expedite the movement of iron ore from Venezuela through ore loading docks of the U.S. Steel Company in Mobile to Birmingham, Alabama via the l &N. Today, as always, the old reliable is an important part of the region it serves, integrated into the pattern of its agriculture, its industry, its way of life. As a citizen of the community and a heavy taxpayer all along its lines, its properties are scattered through the entire Central South. Yards and terminals, freight stations, warehouses and office buildings, This is the passenger station in Mobile, recently completed by the l and at a cost of almost a million dollars. And another fine new station, this one at New Orleans, recently completed by the city and eight railroads, including the l and entering New Orleans. The new classification yard at Radnor, Tennessee, near Nashville. This yard embodies the most modern facilities for the handling of freight traffic, with yard and terminal public address system, pneumatic tubes and handling of waybills, and other automatic and mechanical devices that mean more efficient handling in less time.
other new installations, buildings, rolling stock, tracks, all the numberless structures and devices involved in the day-to-day -day handling of a modern railroad's tremendous traffic, all adding up to an l and property value of more than $700 million. After more than a century of service, the old reliable today serves 13 states with a population of more than 50 million, supplying a vital segment of the nation's railroad system. The l and serves the important gateways of Cincinnati, Louisville, Evansville, East St. Louis, St. Louis, Memphis, Atlanta, Norton, Virginia, Birmingham, Montgomery, New Orleans, and Chattahoochee, Florida, providing valuable freight and passenger traffic connections with other major railroads and linking the Southland with every other sector of the nation. L&N's lines to the Gulf Coast ports provide a fast bridge into American markets for foreign goods and a convenient avenue of trade in the opposite direction for American export, especially Mexico and Central and South America. Here we see the Port of Mobile, a key terminal of the L&N for import-export freight. The L&N worked in close cooperation with Mobile civic and business leaders to improve and expand these dock facilities. Moving along the Mississippi Gulf Coast, through other Gulf cities, Pascagoula, Biloxi, Gulfport, Pas Christian, Bay St. Louis, to New Orleans, the l and Southern Terminal, and one of the busiest, most important ports in the country. Here, the vessels of all nations unload their cargoes for transshipment by rail throughout North America. To be reloaded with American goods, delivered to the docks by rail, for shipment to the far corners of the world. The prosperity of any railroad is always tied in with the prosperity of the territory it serves. And so it is always part of l and plan of operations to assist in the growth and development of the territory, to open up new areas for factories and allied industrial operations. Selling the South is the heart of the l and development program, established as a separate department more than 50 years ago and staffed by men experienced in industrial and economic development. These men supply the facts and figures, the up-to-date information on sites, labor resources, transportation facilities, utilities supply, a complete picture of industrial and agricultural opportunities as well as community life throughout the Central South. The major aim of this program is to attract new industries, and to retain and assist in the growth of industries already established in the area. Continued assistance is also rendered in the promotion of agricultural growth. The value of the l and Regional Development Program is in evidence wherever you go, in the form of hundreds of new business enterprises along the l and lines, new mines, small shops and factories, huge mills and industrial plants. But a railroad is more than property, operational routine, and investment. A railroad is people. It is the human element that made the l and possible in the first place and has kept it alive and prosperous down through the years. The shareholders, 15,000 of them in every state of the union. The employees, 25,000 strong, lifeblood of the system, the most valuable asset the company has today or has ever had in its long history. Devotion to duty, loyalty to the company, dependability in giving service to travelers and shippers. These are the day-to-day -day work principles that have earned for l and employees, and therefore for the company, the excellent public relations that exist today throughout the entire l and system. During the more than 100 years of its existence, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad has grown as the nation itself has grown year by year greater in capacity and strength, ever more secure in its stature as an institution of the South. Looking back, the company feels a warm and satisfying pride in having been a vigorous partner and friendly neighbor with others who helped to explore and expand the frontiers of wealth and opportunity that are a heritage of this Central South region. Now, looking forward to a second century of service, the old reliable sees a new South,
a land of ever greater wealth and opportunity, where venture capital can reap rich rewards in the American tradition of free enterprise. The L&N strives always to deserve the continued patronage of its friends and to keep on helping to build a more prosperous South. It wishes, therefore, to reaffirm the basic principles that have guided it over the years, as embodied in the l and Creed. To furnish the best possible and most courteous public service at the lowest possible rates. To grant good wages and working conditions to its employees. To earn and pay a fair return to the investors in its securities. To improve its properties in order to keep progressive and modern. And finally, to strive for a more intensive development of the territory and communities it serves. These are the policies which express the spirit of the LNN. Pioneer, builder, public servant. Built under the impetus of private enterprise into a modern progressive transportation system. The railroad known by generations of travelers and shippers as the old reliable. A big eight wheel is steaming down the rail. The generals are coming, carrying the mail. Four wheels leading and riding back. Four big drivers grabbing track. Black smoke a belching in the sun. Hot steams a hissing, singing on the run. Singing of the general and his ribbon. Then came a shadow sweeping through the veil. The devil's coming, sings the nightingale. The wars are starting, sound attack. You fight to live or don't come back. Where rebel trains keep moving on, freight cars are flying, singing on the run, singing of the general and his ribbon. Twas then a railroad deep in Dixieland became the target of a northern plan. The Yankees crying, we must track the western and Atlantic track. An engine named the General must be one. The trains are coming, singing on the run. Singing of the General and his 
river. Just north of Marietta, where lay Big Shanty Town, there Andrews Raiders stole the train. The rebels' guard was down. But Fuller and his rebel crew began their frantic race to catch the raiders and the train. Twas called the famous chase. The raiders' hopes were riding high as Andrews and his men did cut the wire, destroyed the rail, then hurried on again. Fuller came in hot pursuit, an engine he had found, with throttle out in full reverse, no time to turn around. Then 80 miles along the track, their goal almost in view, the raiders lost the general to Fuller and his crew. And when the Civil War was through, both Yank and Reb acclaimed the role the general had played, the prize eternal fame. Yes, sir, I'm the general, and I'm mighty proud of my ribbon, the ribbon of steel rail on which I ran and which is now a part of the l &N Railroad. You know, it's been a long time since I roared up the track in the Great Chase. In fact, it's been a long time since I've traveled any track at all. But my long rest is almost over. Pretty soon I'll be ready to ride the rails again under my own steam. Oh, I don't mind a rest now and then. It's a good chance to sit back and think. When you've been around as long as I have, you've got lots of things to remember about history and railroads, especially about the l and Railroad and its role in our history, like back in the 1850s. About the time I was getting up my first head of steam, the l and was laying its first track, starting from Louisville and going 185 miles across some pretty rugged country all the way down to Nashville. Better swing that hammer From here to Nashville Gonna build us a railroad Hold the yelling in line Swing you gandy dancers Better swing that hammer Another mile, another hill When you can't go over Gotta bust right through Gotta bust that rock, boy Gotta cross some rivers Both wide and flooded Gonna build us a big bridge Cross the wild green river Better hold that timber, better swing that hammer, got to build a railroad, from here to Nashville, is a mighty long way, don't you miss that spike boy? Working and chanting in an unending rhythm, the track crews pushed a line through a wilderness, and the Louisville and Nashville Railroad was open for business. Two fine cities at either end and lots of towns in between were joined together for the first time by the L&N. Call the l &N line. Now the l &N hadn't been in operation long before the entire nation was plunged into civil war. Railroads all over the country were called upon for the first time to play their vital role of transporting anything and everything necessary to wage war. Men, guns, food, medicine, ammunition, all were moved in great quantities by the railroads. And because of their great value, railroads became the prime military objective of both northern and southern armies. And because of its strategic location, connecting north to south, 
the LNN Railroad was bitterly fought for. Over and over again, track would be torn up, replaced, then torn up again. In 1862, the federal troops moved south all the way to Nashville, and as they retreated, the Confederates destroyed track, trestles, and bridges. The LNN then became a favorite target of Morgan's raiders, who struck and struck again to capture supplies for the South and to destroy the railroad. Then the Confederates, under General Bragg, surged up the LNN track toward Louisville. They veered off and then were turned back in the bloody conflict at Perryville, and the LNN was again in Union hands. Many brave men fought and died beside the LNN tracks. Then the war was over and the survivors began the long trek home. I'm going home, going home. The bloody war is done, Lord is done. My body's broken sore, oh I'll never fight no more. I'm Down the tracks, ne'er to roam. There are tears in my eyes for those fallen by the ties who ne'er will go home, ne'er go home. I'm going home. a great part of our nation was a sorry sight to behold. Yet the men who ran the l &N Railroad were convinced that out of this devastation would come a new land of even greater wealth than before. And the l &N set itself to building a new transportation system that would help put lifeblood into the veins of a broken economic system. Rebuilding the South took place over a long period of time but one of the first things that had to be done was to restore the railroads. Bridges and track had to be rebuilt and rolling stock salvaged and put back into operating condition. The l &N financed bankrupt railroads and physically aided in rebuilding deserted ones. The l &N pressed all of its available resources into service with but one thought in mind. If the people throughout the South were to recover quickly, if the land and the cities were to be productive again, then there must be railroad transportation available. Trains to haul the cotton and other crops to market. Trains to bring new material to the cities so that people could rebuild their homes and begin new industries. I remember one new industry in particular because the l &N played such an important part in its growth and in the growth of a city, Birmingham. It began as little more than a railroad intersection but nearby were large deposits of iron ore and coal. 
There was a small plant, too, which made pig iron from the iron ore, using charcoal in the process. The LNN backed an experiment to see if coke could be used instead of charcoal. Coke, which could be made from the nearby deposits of coal. The experiment proved that coke was superior to charcoal in the production of pig iron, and an industry was born. And as the industry grew, Birmingham grew. And as fast as Birmingham produced the pig iron, and later high-grade steel, the LNN started the products on the way to markets all over the world. Coal makes coke and coke makes iron, iron makes steel and steel makes rails, rails haul coal, rails haul coal. As the iron and steel industry grew, the need for coal increased, and the railroad was able to aid the growth of another industry, coal mining. There were rich coal fields in the Cumberland Mountains of eastern Kentucky and Tennessee. The coal was very high grade, but the area was almost inaccessible. Yet the LNN did construct track into this wild country in the firm belief that the iron and steel industries of the nation would use, would demand the high quality Cumberland coal for their furnaces. The railroads were built. The demand for the coal became a reality and the people of the Cumberland found employment in the vast coal mining industry. Until the 1880s, most of the railroads south of the Ohio River used a different gauge track from those north of the Ohio. So it was decided that all the railroads in the south would change from their five-foot gauge to a gauge of four feet nine inches. Of course, this changeover had to be done quickly, and the LNN set out to change its 2,000 miles of track in one day. Change your rails, boys. <coughs> one short day, boys. <coughs> From Cincy down to Mobile Town, from Nashville to Orleans. <coughs> Eight thousand men at changing rail, well, how those hammers ring. <coughs> Change your rail, boys. <coughs> Bend it back, boys. <coughs> One short day to do the job, so sweat and bend it back. <coughs> Gotta change the gauge today, two thousand miles of track. <coughs> It was about the time they changed the gauge that I began my long retirement, which is about to come to an end at last. But in those years while I was resting, the LNN was moving forward, serving many more cities, adding new track, improving its rolling stock. By 1917, the LNN had over 1,000 locomotives in service when America went to war. The LNN, like all the railroads, did a tremendous job in transporting material and men to the war and back home again. The war is over, the fighting's done. The war is over, the battle's won. The horns are blow, blow, blowing, yanks are no, no, knowing. It's great, 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 we're glad they're home. To an old war veteran like myself, it didn't seem long at all between the time World War I ended and the next one began and the railroads again were called upon to do the vital job that only they could do. For only the railroads can carry the tremendous volumes of men and material needed to wage modern war. And when the war was over, the railroads not only had to make the changeover from a war to a peacetime operation, but they were also in the process of another type of change. The age of steam was coming to an end. Old steam locomotives were being superseded by new diesel giants. The big steam locomotives were making their last runs. They had done their job, and now they were roaring into history. Big steam engine, tell me if you know why the trains of steam must go. Diesel oil will take the stand, run them better than steam can. Big steam engine, before you go, let me hear your whistle blow. The 
the age of steam was gone forever, giving way to a mighty new power. And as the diesel replaced the steam engine, a new era of railroad modernization was ushered in. Radio telephone communication, push button operation, electronic data processing, piggyback, automatic switching, the LNN railroad system, now serving this great area of the South, the new age of railroading has taken over. Yes, 
the new age of railroading has taken over. But I will always remain to remind you of the history that has gone before. A big eight wheel is steaming down the rail. The generals are coming, carrying the mail. Four wheels leading and right in back. Four big drivers grabbing track. Black smoke a belching in the sun. Hot steams a hissing, singing on the run. Singing of the general and his river.